Chapter 17 Its official name was the Grand Rim Promenade, and even on a world that prided itself on engineering achievements as much as Sajani did, clearly did, it was a remarkable achievement indeed. Thirty meters wide of this greatest expanse, attached to the eastern wall of the canyonade about two-thirds of the way from floor to rim, it stretched the entire length, over ten kilometers, of the canyon. Small trade and vending booths were set up all along the canyon wall. The commercial areas interspersed with conversation circles or tiny contoured meditation gardens or sculpture clusters. At other spots, the wall had been left completely open to allow unobstructed observation of interesting natural vegetation clumps or the small waterfalls that dribbled softly down towards the canyon floor below. The far more interesting view, though, was on the other side of the promenade. Beyond the chest-high, elaborately tooled metal mesh guard wall, one could look down into the canyonade itself, to the city that had been created across the floor and sides. At regular intervals, the guard wall opened up into the sky arches that curved gracefully across the canyon to the lesser and more utilitarian walkways on the far side. The sky arches were arranged in diamond-patterned groups of nine, three connecting with the promenade, two each connecting with the walkways above and below it, one each from the walkways above and below those. An impressive achievement, made all the more so by the fact that the entire 300-year-old structure was held solidly in place without any repulsor lift support whatsoever. Walking along the promenade, gazing across through the gathering darkness at the scattering of lights across the canyon and down below, Luke wondered if anyone in these modern days would have both the skill and the self-confidence to undertake anything of this magnitude. Rolling along at Luke's side, R2 twittered uneasily. Don't worry, R2. I'm not going to get too close to the edge, Luke soothed the little droid, shifting his shoulders beneath his hooded cloak. Anyway, it's not dangerous. The brochure said there are emergency tractor beams set up to catch anyone who falls. R2 warbled a not entirely convinced acknowledgement. Then, rotating his dome for a surreptitious look behind them, he beeped a question. Yes, Luke told him soberly. He's still following us. Had been following them, in fact, since shortly after their arrival on the promenade. A large, bulky alien, slipping in and out of the other pedestrians with unlikely grace. Luke wasn't sure exactly what he and R2 had been spotted and identified. Possibly during the turbolift ride down from the spaceport. Possibly not until they'd arrived on the promenade itself. For that matter, it was entirely possible they hadn't been identified at all. Their tail could simply be a local thief hoping to relieve a helpless stranger of his astromech droid. If so, he was going to be in for a surprise. R2 twittered again. Patience, Luke told him, looking around. They had come to end of the end of one of the groups of wall-hugging businesses now, and were starting into a wide area that featured only a waterfall or two currently unoccupied conversational areas. Quiet, peaceful, and as private as Luke had yet seen up here. An ideal place for holding an impromptu conversation. Or for springing an ambush. Let's pause here a moment, he said to R2, crossing over towards the outer edge of the promenade. They were roughly in the middle of the quiet area now, with the waterfall rippling softly behind them. Picking a section of guard wall, Luke stopped walking and leaned his elbows on the top rail, stretching out to the force as he did so. There was a subtle change in the emotions of their pursuer now a change that felt to Luke like the other had made a decision. He's coming, Luke muttered to R2. I think he's alone, but there could still be trouble. Keep back out of the way, all right? The droid acknowledged with a nervous twitter, rolling a meter back in response. Resettling his elbows on the guard wall, Luke gazed out into the canyonade, a gentle shiver running up his back as he listened to the quiet footsteps approaching from the side. As near as he could tell, this was the ex exact spot where he'd seen himself in that vision. The footsteps stopped. Pardon me, a gentle voice asked. Are you the Jedi Master Luke Skywalker? Luke turned, getting his first look at the being who'd been following them. He was of an unfamiliar species, tall and broad, with dark shell plates half hidden beneath a fur-trimmed cloak. His head was large, with alert black eyes and small spikes where the mouth would have been on a human. I'm Skywalker, yes, Luke confirmed. And you? I am Moshin Trey, the alien said, 
Unyala of the Kasta tribe of the Red Laren people of the Relnus Minor. He reached a Wookiee-sized hand to the collar of his cloak and turned the edge back. Fastened on the underside was a distinctive gold filigree pin. I am also a New Republic observer. I am honored to meet you, sir. And I you, Luke said, nodding in greeting as his last vestiges of tension faded away. The observers were an experimental, quasi-official part of the New Republic, created in this latest round of governmental policy reorganizations. Moving freely about their assigned sectors, their job was to report directly to the High Council and Senate, whatever they saw or heard, with a particular eye towards improper governmental activities that the local or sector authorities might prefer to keep out of sight. There had been some early fears that the observers might evolve into the kind of secret security forces that the Empire had used with such devastating effect during its reign of terror. So far, though, that didn't seem to be happening. The various governments that had undertaken to sponsor observers had chosen their candidates carefully, with an eye towards hiring only strongly ethical beings, and then strictly defining the limits of their mandate. The fact that the observers were assigned to sectors far away from their homes and any local of species rivalries undoubtedly helped encourage their sponsors to pick candidates who were as incorruptible and impartial as possible. A similar system had been used in the Old Republic, Luke knew, with the Jedi Knights acting in the observer's role. Perhaps someday his academy graduates would be numerous enough, and trusted enough, to once again take on that duty. What may I do to help you? he asked. Please forgive my impertinence in walking within your shadow, Trey continued. But I felt a burden to speak with you, and needed to be certain of your identity before I approached. I understand, Luke said. No harm done. How may I help you? The Rilaran stepped up to the guard wall beside Luke and waved a massive hand downward. I wished you to see what is happening in the canyonade tonight. To see and to understand. Luke turned back to the guard wall and looked down. All he could see were the normal street and vehicle lights of a modern city. Where am I supposed to be looking? he asked. There, Trey said, pointing towards a large diamond-shaped area near the center of the canyonade directly across from where the two of them stood. Though bordered by normal street illumination, the area itself was almost completely dark, with only a handful of tiny lights showing near the center. It looks like a park, Luke hazarded, mentally calling up the map of the canyon aid he'd looked at on his way into the spaceport. Tranquility Common, perhaps. That is correct, Trey said. Do you see the lights in the center? Yes, Luke said. They're... He paused, frowning. In the past few seconds, as he and Trey had been speaking, the number of lights had seemingly doubled. Still grouped closely together... And then, even as he watched, a new circle of lights was added to the group. They are lights of peace, Trey said. Tonight, the peoples of Sesyani gather together in support of justice. Yes, Luke said. He could see all too well where this one was going. Justice. I perceive from your tone of voice that you do not yet understand, Trey said, his own tone one of mild reproof. The High Council and Senate dismiss all such demonstrations as riots by the violent or ignorant, or else as plots by the Empire. But such is not always the case. I don't think the Senate sees things quite that simplistically, Luke said. Still, he had to admit that Trey had a point. So what third category would the demonstrations down there fall into? As I said, the support of justice, the Rilaran said. The white lights you see are in remembrance of the peoples of Kamas. Soon now. Yes, there. Do you see? Luke nodded. Around the group of white lights, a thin circle of blue lights had appeared. As he watched, more were added, creating an ever-growing ring of blue around the white. I see them. They signify remembrance for the victims of the Vrash slaughter, Trey told him. The land the perpetrators gained by that act has yielded great wealth to them, yet neither the Pasak government nor the New Republic has insisted that any of that wealth be given to the survivors' families, as both the custom and ancient law of that world demand. One of my Jedi students was of the Vrash, Luke said, his heart stirring at the memory. He had a great deal of anger to work through before his training could properly begin. 
Their rage is understandable, Trey said. Yet there is no such anger in those gathered below. He gestured again towards the growing circle of light. Not in the way humans define anger. They are quiet and peaceful, threatening no one. But they will not forget those who were wronged, nor will they allow those in power to forget. Yes, Luke murmured. There are indeed some things that must never be forgotten. For a few minutes they stood in silence and watched. The circle of blue lights continued to grow, and then, as the white center had given way to blue, the blue gave way to yellow. The yellow was joined and encircled in turn by red, then by pale green, then violet, and finally an outer ring of white. They are all gathered, Trey said, when the series of concentric rings was complete. Those are the ones who have tonight donated their time in remembrance. Others will donate their time other nights, and as all look down upon the lights, they too will remember. And all of such Johnny will strengthen in their resolve to petition the seats of power until all such wrongs are righted. Luke shook his head. Except that none of these wrongs can be righted, Unyala Trey, he said. Not Kamas, not any of them. The Sisyani understand that, the Rilaran said. They know the dead cannot be brought back to life, nor devastated worlds be made whole again. They merely seek such justice as is within the power of mortal beings to grant. And what justice would they seek for Kamas, Luke persisted? The punishment of the entire Bothan race for the crimes of a few? Many would say that such would not be true justice, Trey agreed. But others would not share that opinion and their voices, too, must be heard. He pointed to the circles of light. But now see. They demonstrate that justice cannot be limited to any one people or event. Justice must exist for all. Luke frowned. The neat circles were breaking up, the different colors starting to mix together at the edges. His first thought was that the demonstration had ended and the participants were starting to leave but the overall group of lights didn't seem to be getting any larger. The colors continued to bleed together, the rings giving way to a more homogeneous mix of color. And suddenly he understood. The participants were leaving their own circles of remembrance and interweaving with the people of the other circles. It was a quiet yet deeply moving demonstration of unity. Some of those now in the common do indeed believe that the entire Botham species should be held accountable for the crime of Kamas, Trey said quietly, at least in regard to reparations to the surviving Kamasi. Other Sisyasi reject that argument, yet agree that in suppressing knowledge of their part in the crime, the Botham leadership is forfeited in the rights to claims of innocence. There will also be visiting off-worlders in the common, holding lights alongside them whose opinions will be equally varied. Sounds like it's about the same here as everywhere else in the galaxy, Luke said. True, Trey said. The point I wish to make, Master Skywalker, is that these differences are not the result of enemy plots or even posturings among political rivals. They are the genuine and honest differences of opinion among the many beings who make up the New Republic. To dismiss any of them as unimportant to run thinking is to insult the honor and integrity of those beings and their cultures. I know, Luke said. I'm sure the Senate does, too. The problem is how to reconcile all those differences, not just over Kamas, but also in a thousand other matters. I do not know how you will succeed, Trey said. I only know that it must be done, and that it must be done quickly. Already I have heard the stirrings of genuine anger at the Senate's inaction on this matter. There are other even more disturbing stirrings whispered suggestions that the New Republic no longer cares what any world does against its neighbors or adversaries. Even now, some are preparing to settle old grievances, while others seek new alliances for protection. Luke sighed. I've lost track of how many times the New Republic government has been accused of being too heavy-handed in one crisis or another over the past few years. Now they're trying to let the sectors and systems do more of their own governing, so of course they're being accused of doing nothing. Does this surprise you? Trey asked. The one truism in all politics is that loud voices will be raised against any decision that is made. Yes, Luke said, looking down at the flickering lights below. Many of those now demonstrating will be gathering later tonight at the Thoughts or Freedom Tap Cafe, Trey said. 
It is on the far side of the common at the western corner of the diamond. If you choose to meet with them, they will be pleased to speak their thoughts to you. I'm sure they will, Luke said, carefully hiding a grimace. Thank you for taking the time to show me this. It is my sworn duty to provide information to the leaders of the New Republic, the Rivaran said gravely. It is a swearing I take most seriously. He placed his fingertips together and inclined his head. I thank you in turn for your time and attention, Master Skywalker, and I urge you to visit the Thoughts of Freedom this night. You will gain much knowledge there. Inclining his head again, he turned and headed back along the promenade. Behind Luke, R2 whistled softly, and he turned to see the little droid standing up on mechanical tiptoe as he gazed at the lights of the canyon aid below. It's impressive, all right, Luke agreed soberly. That's what makes this so hard to deal with. So much of it really is honest differences of opinion. R2 warbled again, his dome swiveling pointedly in the direction of the sky arch to their left, the direction they would go to get across the canyon aid and down to the tap cafe Trey had mentioned. I suppose we ought to go take a look, Luke said reluctantly. Though I doubt we'll get any new information there. It'll just be more opinions. He pushed away from the guard wall and started walking towards the entrance to the sky arch. If you want real information, you have to go to someone like Talon Card, he continued, as R2 rolled alongside like a well-trained pet. In fact, I've been thinking that maybe we ought to try to get in touch with him. R2 made a rude-sounding noise. I hope that's for the current attitude towards him on Coruscant, Luke warned, and not for Card himself. He's done a lot for the New Republic. The droid gave an ambiguous twitter, followed by a remarkably good impression of a pile of coins clinking together. Yes, I know he's been paid for his help, Luke acknowledged. You might remember that money was the reason Han first got involved with the Rebellion, too, and he's turned out pretty good. They reached the entrance to the Sky Arch and stepped onto the umbrella-roofed guard-walled bridge. Like the Rim Promenade itself, the Canyon Aid Sky Arches were remarkably ex remarkable examples of engineering skill, curving gently and gracefully across the half-kilometer gorge without the benefit of extra supports or suspension cables. The right side of the walkway was finished in a simple non-slip surface, clearly designed for casual strollers or those who wanted to pause and linger over the view of the Canyon Aid below. The left side, in contrast, was equipped with a pair of slideways for the serious traveler who merely wished to go from one side to the other. It would have been a pleasant walk, Luke thought, with a quiet pang of regret, but he didn't seem to have the time lately for such simple pleasures. The important point is that Card has always come up to us first with information that we need, he added to R2, ushering the droid onto the slideway and stepping on behind him. Whether he admits it or not, he really is on our side. R2 swiveled his dome around to face Luke, made an I-suppose-so sort of grunt, then rotated back to face forward again. The slideway was speeding up, Luke noted with interest, accelerating steadily as they approached the center of the arch. Presumably the entire strip wasn't speeding up, which would create quite a challenge for anyone trying to get onto the strip behind him. Composed of some kind of pseudo-fluid material, he guessed, using a variable laminar flow to create variable speeds along its length. One more engineering marvel to add to the list. They reached the top of the arch, and he was just thinking of asking R2 to analyze the slideway for him when he felt a flicker in the force. It wasn't much, little more than a twinge in the near distance, but it was enough. Somewhere very near at hand, someone was, pre was preparing for murder. He stepped off the slideway, fighting for a moment with the abrupt change in speed before he regained his balance. R2, suddenly missing him, squawked in surprise, then squawked again as Luke stretched out with the force and lifted him bodily into the air. Quiet, Luke admonished as he set the droid down on the stationary section of the walkway. Looking around, he stretched out again with the force. The murderous intent was still there, somewhere close by, but though there were a handful of other pedestrians in sight, there was nothing he could see that appeared to fit the sensation. At least, not on this particular sky arch. He turned around, peering upward beneath the edge of his sky arch's roof, and through the guard wall mesh of the sky arch running parallel one level above him. And there they were, perhaps ten meters farther along from where he stood. 
Two cloaked and hooded figures standing with their backs pressed against the guard wall, the smaller child-sized figure clinging to the taller one. Beyond them, Luke could just make out the shadowy forms of three assailants moving slowly and confidently in on them. In the hand of one of them, he caught the glint of a blade. There was no time to waste, and exactly one route that had any chance of getting Luke to them in time. It would take a hefty jump, but nothing that a Jedi drawing on the Force couldn't easily handle. The only imponderable was whether the Canyon Aid's safety tractor beams would react fast enough to snatch him in midair and whisk him helplessly away. There was only one way to find out. Wait here, R2, he murmured. Stretching out to the force, he hopped over the slideway to the top of his sky arch's guard wall. For a pair of heartbeats, he crouched there, steadying his balance as he did one final visual measurement of the distance up and across to the other sky arch. Then, taking a deep breath, he again drew on the force and leaped. The emergency tractor beams were obviously not as hair-trigger as he'd feared, and he reached the other side without so much as a nudge from them. Catching the top of the other sky arch's guard wall, he swung his legs through the openings between guard wall and roof to land on a slight crouch on the non-moving section of the walkway. He took in the tableau laid out before him in a glance. The two prospective victims, as he'd already seen, were standing ahead and to his right, their backs pressed against the guard wall. The hood on the taller of them had slipped back, revealing the lined face and white hair of an old woman. The face of the child clinging to her side, most likely a grandchild, and even great-grandchild, considering the woman's age, was still completely in shadow. But Luke didn't need to see an expression. The way the child clutched the old woman's side was all the evidence anyone needed to recognize the silent terror there. A terror that was well-founded. From the lower sky arch, Luke had seen three knife-wielding men closing in on them. Now, from his new vantage point, he could see that those three were merely the inner circle of a much larger group. Nine other men were standing a few paces farther back, forming a semicircle around their intended prey. All nine of them had the hardened faces of men whose lives had been shaped by violence and cruelty. All nine had blasters out and ready. And at the moment, all nine of those faces, and five of those blasters, were pointed at Luke. That's far enough, Luke called, straightening up from his landing crouch. Put down your weapons. I've got a better idea, one of the men snarled, his voice as nasty as his appearance. Why don't you turn around and walk away while you still can? I don't think so, Luke said, trying to sound more confident than he felt. With five, six now, blasters trained on him, it was going to be a race to see whether he could get his lightsaber out fast enough to deflect the shots that would be coming his direction the instant he made a move towards the weapon. But there was the slideway two steps to his left, one section going each direction, both moving at a reasonably high speed. We're wasting time, one of the other men spat. Burn him and let's... And in that instant, in the middle of the sentence, the child moved. It was so quiet and so smooth that at first Luke didn't realize what was happening. The child rotated out of his panicked death grip on the old woman towards the nearest of the knife-wielding assailants, one arm swinging across the man like a stylized slap across his chest that fell short of its intended mark. The arm movement seemed to deflect the child like a ricocheted stone towards the second assailant. The slapping movement again, and he was now swinging towards the third man. And with a gurgling gasp, the first man collapsed into a heap on the ground. Someone swore with startled viciousness. The blasters pointed that Luke wavering his sudden confusion intruded on what two seconds earlier been a solidly secure situation. Heads turned back towards the child and his grandmother. And then the second man crumpled, and the third man started to do the same, his knife now inexplicably in the child's hand. But only briefly. An instant later, with an abbreviated flick of the wrist, the knife flashed across the short distance to bury itself in the chest of one of the other assailants. And as it did so, the hood fell back far enough to finally expose the child's face. It wasn't a child beneath that cloak. It was a Nagri. That single glance was the last clear view any of them had of the alien. For some, it was the last clear view of anything they would ever see. Even as Luke grabbed for his lightsaber, the Nagri became a blur of motion, diving, rolling, slashing with blades now in both hands, evading the frantic sputtering of blaster shots with casual ease. A grenade clattered to the walkway at the old woman's feet, 
vanished as Luke reached out through the force to maneuver it through the gap between the guard wall and roof and sent it hurtling straight up. By the time it exploded harmlessly far above them, the battle was over. Master Skywalker, the Nogri said, nodding gravely from the center of the carnage as he slid his two assassins' knives back into concealment. I am honored by your presence and grateful for your assistance. Such as it was, Luke said, shaking his head in astonishment. He'd seen Nogri in training and practice combat and had thought he knew the limits of their fighting skills. He hadn't even been close. Somehow, I think you would have managed quite well without me. Your pardon, but that is not true, the Nogri demurred, stepping over the bodies and coming over to him. Your distraction was most timely, allowing me nearly four extra seconds I would otherwise not have had. Not to mention the grenade, the old woman added. She had crouched down beside one of the dead and was going through his pockets with practiced fingers. If not for your quick action, we could all have been killed. Thank you. You're welcome, Luke said, eyeing her with growing doubts as she finished her search and moved on to the next body. A Nagri warrior and a woman with the expertise of a professional pickpocket were not exactly what he'd had in mind when he'd come leaping to the rescue. May I ask who you are? Not who you're probably afraid I am, the woman said, pausing in her search to flash him a smile. It's really quite honest and mostly respectable. My name is Miranda Savage. Plaquebiarch here is merely attached to me as my bodyguard. We work for an old acquaintance of yours. Talon Card. Really, Luke said. Oddly enough, I was just thinking about trying to make contact with Card. Well, you've come to the right place, Miranda said, straightening up. He's just arrived on Sisjani. You're joking, Luke said, frowning. What's he doing here? Whoever knows what Card's doing anywhere, Miranda countered philosophically. Why don't you come along and ask him yourself? Luke looked down through the guard wall at the city lights below. Once again, he'd managed to be in the right place at the right time. The force was indeed with him. Thank you, he said to Miranda. I believe I will. Chief? Card looked up from his desk to find Denkin's head poking around the open office doorway. Yes, what is it? Savage and her dog regard are here, Denkin said. She's got the data drop you wanted. Good, Card said, frowning slightly. Back when the wild Card's bridge crew had been preparing to spring booster Tarek's errant venture on the unsuspecting Hisishi, uh, Denkin had been wearing a half-concealed grin. He was wearing that same grin now. And, Card prompted. The grin came fully out of concealment. And they also brought you a surprise. Really, Card said, letting the temperature of his voice cool a couple of degrees. I hope you remember how much I liked surprises. You'll like this one, Chief, Dankin assured him, stepping aside and gesturing. Plaquebarac and Miranda Savage emerged around the doorway and stepped into the office, the latter holding a data drop cylinder in her hand and coming in behind them. Well, I'll be kesseled, Card said, getting to his feet. A pleasant surprise indeed. Hello, Skywalker. Card? Skywalker nodded in greeting. I'm surprised to find you here. The feeling's mutual, Card agreed. Are you alone? Artu's with me, Skywalker said, nodding back over his shoulder. He spotted the G29T repair droid working off your cargo bay and stopped for a chat. I hope he enjoys it, Card said, taking the cylinder from Miranda and glancing at its markings. That's the last G2 I'm ever going to buy. Any trouble, Miranda? We were jumped on the way back, she told him. Twelve men. Very professional. No indication as to who they were working for. Probably one of the huts, Card said, turning the cylinder over in his hand. They weren't exactly thrilled about losing this. Could be, Miranda said. Whoever they were, Plakmarak took care of them. With assistance from Master Skywalker, the Nogri added in his gravelly voice. He arrived at exactly the proper moment. Jedi Masters have that knack, Card said dryly, handing the cylinder back to Miranda. Good. Take it to O'Donnell. Then you could go and relax in the crew lounge while he checks it out and issues your payment. 
Would you be interested in taking on another assignment? Only if it's more fun than courier work, Miranda said. Apart from the attack, it was all rather boring. She waved a hand each towards Luke and Plackmarack. And with these two around, even that part wasn't very exciting. I'll try to do better the next time, Card promised. As a matter of fact, I have one job in particular where your talents might prove useful. Check back here after you've been paid and we'll talk, all right? Fine, Miranda said, nodding. Plackrack gave an abbreviated Nogri bow, and together they left the office. Card cocked an eyebrow at Skywalker. Thank you for your help. I believe it's now my turn to owe you one. Hardly, the other said. Plackmarack vastly overstates my assistance back there. Yes, they don't generally need much help, do they, Card agreed. I've been very pleased with their service. Aside from running interference against hot hirelings, what brings you to Sisjani? Skywalker shrugged. The Force, actually, he said. I was trying for a vision of the future, and I saw myself here. So here I am. Ah, Card said. Not a scheduling technique I'd be comfortable with, personally. I'm not exactly used to it myself, Skywalker said. On the other hand, I was just thinking about trying to get in touch with you, and here you are. So it seems to have worked. What are you doing here anyway, if I may ask? <coughs> Pardon me. It's not a secret, Card assured him. At least not from you. I've been looking into the possibility that outside agitators might be involved in some of the protests that have been cropping up around the New Republic. Since this Johnny has a long history of peaceful demonstrations, I thought it would be an obvious target for subversion. Makes sense, Skywalker mused. Though maybe it's too obvious. Depends on how subtle or unknown agitators decide to be, Card said. I thought it still worth checking out. You said you'd wanted to talk to me? Yes, Skywalker said. I've been wondering if you'd made any progress on our clone hunt. None whatsoever, Card conceded. None of my information sources have, you ever, have heard even a whisper of clone activity. If they're out there, whoever's using them is keeping it very quiet. Hmm, Skywalker murmured. How about the Kavirhu pirates? Card shook his head. They seem to have gone to ground. He cocked an eyebrow. Not that I really blame them. Being chased out of your most secure base by a Jedi Master must be a rather disconcerting experience. You were chased off Merker by Grand Admiral Thrawn, and you didn't panic, Skywalker reminded him. Card forced a smile. The memories of that time still provoked unpleasant twinges. Perhaps I'm made of stronger stuff, or perhaps I just don't panic quite so noticeably. On his desk, the intercom twittered, and he leaned over to touch the switch. Yes? It was Dankin, his expression suddenly and uncharacteristically grim. Priority message coming through from the starry ice, he said tartly. Fawn says Mera has been captured. Card felt his stomach tighten as he dropped back into his desk chair. Is Fawn still on? Mostly, Dankin said. The signal's a little funny. Too many relays in the mix, but it's mostly clear. Com 5. Card keyed onto the channel, dimly aware that Skywalker had circled the desk and come up beside him. This is Card. Fawn? Yes, sir, Fawn's voice came, wavering slightly with the distortion of multiple hyperspace relays. We reached the Neuron system and observed an unidentified spacecraft land on the second planet. Jade took our defender and went in. We got a pulse transmission from a recorder that indicated she was in trouble. Captured. Maybe worse. Card could hear his heart thudding in his ears. Dankin, do we have a copy of the recording? Right here, Dankin's voice said. Play it. He listened as it played through. The flight and landing. Mira's discovery of the cave and fortress. Her startled exclamation and that final sickening thud. Get, get his issue started on a scrub right away, Card ordered. That thud had sounded far too much like the sound of a body hitting the ground. I want everything you can get off that recording. We're already on it. We did some scrubbing of our own on the way here, Fawn said. There's definitely breathing and a human tempo heartbeat after she goes silent. 
so at least at that point she was still alive. There are fifty or more flying creatures in the cave. We can sort out at least that many sets of wings flapping, though that may not have been who she was talking to. Oh, and from the different speeds of the sound through the air and bone, it looks like that thud was something hitting the front of her, uh, or side of her head. Card grimaced. An attack. Or an accident, Fawn said. We know she was moving just before it happened, and that she was inside a cave. She could have run into a wall or something. We can try an echo analysis, Duncan suggested. Try to figure out how close she was to the wall when she was hit. Yes. Card looked up at Skywalker, standing in dark silence beside him, troubled eyes seemingly focused on empty space. You know anything about this? he asked the Jedi. Either the planet or whoever she was talking to? Skywalker shook his head slowly, his eyes looking even more troubled. No, but I did see a vision of Mera at the same time I saw myself here. And where she was, it might have been a cave. I hated to leave her there, Fawn said, but I also didn't want to risk all of us disappearing without letting someone know what had happened, especially given those ships in that fortress. No, you did the right thing, Card assured her. The question now is how we get her out. He looked up at Skywalker. Or rather, who we send to do the job. Skywalker must have heard the challenge in his voice. His eyes came back from wherever they were staring at to look down at Card. You're suggesting I go? Someone there seems to know you, Card pointed out. At least, Mera thought so. You may be the only one he, or it, or they will be willing to talk to. I can't leave, Skywalker said, the words coming out almost mechanically, his attention clearly elsewhere. I have duties here. You have a duty to Mera, too, Card countered. For that matter, you have a duty to the rest of the New Republic. You saw one of those ships. You know we're dealing with an unknown culture here. If that fortress you saw is made of the same material as the one on Hajarna, they'll be able to sit in there and shrug off any attack we could throw at them. And, all right, Skywalker said, I'll go. Card blinked, taken slightly aback by the suddenness of the decision. He'd expected to have to argue at least a few more minutes and probably throw in something concrete before the other agreed. But he also knew better than to question the decision he was already pushing for. Good, he said. Tell me what you need in the way of equipment or supplies and we'll get it for you. You'll want a bigger ship, of course. Dankin, what do we have available? No time for that, Skywalker said, before Duncan could answer. My X-Wing's over in docking rectangle 16. If you can download a copy of that nav data to R2, we'll get it refueled and be on our way. You can't carry a passenger in an X-Wing, Fawn objected. If she's hurt, then we'll take her ship and leave the X-Wing behind, Skywalker cut her off. We're wasting time. You won't get very far in a Defender, Card reminded him, keying his board on a hunch. Yes, the timing and distances would work. Let me suggest a compromise. You leave here in your X-Wing, and I'll have the Dawn Beat bring the Jade's Fire to meet you off to Rune. Her droid won't be activated, but you and your R2 should be able to fly it without any trouble. Skywalker shook his head. I don't want to try to sneak onto Neron with a ship that big. Then leave the fire hidden somewhere in the outer system and ride your starfighter in, Fawn suggested. The docking port should handle an X-Wing without any problems. Skywalker hesitated the heartbeat, then nodded. All right. Good, Card said. Dankin, get onto the spaceport control and have a fuel order cut for his X-Wing. Number one on the priority list, and you can bribe or threaten whoever you have to to get it there. Then put together the most comprehensive survival kit you can, fit, uh, you can that will fit an X-Wing's cargo hold. Two cubic meters and 110 kilograms, as I recall. Got it, Duncan said. What kind of backup are we going to send in behind him? As much as we can throw together, Card told him, keying for a list of available resources. His organization's fleet was impressively large, but scattered around the entire New Republic the way it was, it would take precious time to collect any kind of attack force together. I don't want any backup, Skywalker Walker cut into his musings. Bringing in the Jade's fire is risky enough. The more ships in the system, the better the chances one of them will be spotted. It'll be better for me to try to slip in by myself. But you can't get around alone, Fawn said. 
I can, Skywalker said, softly. I have to. You can't, Fawn insisted. Card, tell it. For a long moment, Card studied the younger man, his mind flicking back to that first meeting between the two of them aboard the wild card so long ago. Even back then, Skywalker had never been what he would have called brash, but looking at him now, Card was struck by the quiet maturity ten years had added to his face. It's his call, Fawn, he said. If he says he can do it, then he can. Skywalker nodded. Thank you, he said. I think the thanks are all on the other side, Card pointed out, trying to force a smile. All right. Fuel and supplies and the Jade's fire at Darune. What else do you need us to do? Just what you're already doing, Skywalker said. Keep looking into these riots, and if you find anything, get the information to Leia. Done, Card said. Anything else? Yes, Skywalker said, a shadow crossing his face. Could you get word to Leia on Coruscant and tell her where I've gone? I'll go myself, Card promised, getting to his feet again. We'll leave as soon as you're gone. Thank you, Skywalker said. He turned and headed for the office door. You said you saw Mera in a vision, Card called after him. What was she doing? Skywalker paused in the doorway. She was in a rocky place, floating in water, he said, not turning around. And she looked dead. Card nodded slowly. I see. He was still standing there, gazing at the open door, long after Skywalker had gone. And that's the end of the chapter. Hope you enjoyed it. I'll talk to you all real soon.